This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can voice your opinion on the child welfare system. I'm Dennis Lawrence. Next to me is Maria Malin. Thank you for tuning in today. October is designated as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Domestic Violence Awareness Month evolved from the first day of unity observed in October of 1981 by the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. The intent was to connect battered women's advocates across the nation who were working to end violence against women and their children. In October of 1987, the first Domestic Violence Awareness Month was observed. Here at Silent Voices, our own Maria Malin has advocated in this field for years. I'd like to turn the program over to Maria for, for her presentation on domestic violence. As many of you know, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and I was formerly a victim of domestic violence with my ex. And this is a very important month for me just because I believe everybody needs to know how much this affects our children. In January of 2010, I wrote a note that I would like to share with you all. I helped my children through post-traumatic stress disorder. Each one of them were diagnosed with PTSD as well as um, my eldest son was diagnosed with extended post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I have called this for parents of a traumatized child, and I wrote it uh, January 16 of 2010. What parents need to know. Any child old enough to laugh is old enough to experience trauma. A child needs not to witness the abuse to be affected by it and to be traumatized. A child can be traumatized even though they don't understand what has happened. Exposure to violent or nonviolent incidents can lead to trauma. Our children are vulnerable to post-traumatic stress disorder and grief-related reactions such as hypersensitivity to noise. How do I know if my child has experienced grief or trauma? One way that we know is has has your child been exposed to any dv incidents or trauma related accidents again this does not need to be directly witnessed by the child is having difficulty with schoolwork concentrating or remembering issues with your child appears do they appear to be anxious or agitated do they want to be near you more than usual do they refuse to talk about what has happened, or will they continuously talk about what has happened, even if it's an inappropriate time or place? Even if your child was exposed to a potential trauma years earlier, his behavior may be in response to a delayed reaction to that trauma. You should be, re you should be, you should be concerned when your child shows no appropriate fear when in danger or appears to be more fearful than most children their age. Seems more distant from you and from friends. Is acting like a different person since the trauma. May have trouble sleeping. Is afraid to sleep alone or be left 
alone even for short periods of time. It is startled easily by sounds, sights, smells, similar to those that existed at the time of the event. Sometimes they become hypervigilant, watching out for and anticipating that they are about to be or are in danger. Seek safety spots in their environment in whatever room they may be in at the time. Children who sleep on the floor instead of their bed after trauma may do so because they fear the comfort of a bed will allow them to sleep so deep that they won't hear the danger or, or potential danger coming. Becomes irritable, aggressive, acting tough, provoking fights, forgets recently acquired skills, returns to behavior they had previously stopped. And examples of that are bedwetting, nail biting, um, behaviors such as that. There's a lot of them they can return or revert back to. The child may withdraw or want less to do with their friends, develops headaches, stomach aches were a huge issue with my children. They had a lot of, a lot of instances where they had upset stomachs. Um, a lot of times that was return, when they were about to return to the abuser, they would have these stomach aches or if they were getting into a situation that they felt uncomfortable with. Fatigue and other ailments not previously present. The child may become accident prone, taking risks that they have previously avoided, reenacting events as the hero or possibly the victim. It's possible that doctors, nurses, police, social workers, clergy, judges, attorneys, or others will sadly, secondarily, wound these children. One wounding can be as difficult to recover from as multiple, multiple wounds. We call that a lot of times in domestic violence, re-victimization. Betrayal is betrayal, whether it happened once or twice. If you did have multiple secondary victimization, there is a greater likelihood that you will also experience a huge level of guilt and self-blame. When these children are told that their memories are not what really happened, they tend to um, not, they tend to question themselves and question their own memories. <clears throat> it is important to get help for, from professionals with experience in trauma and family abuse who you trust. Always check credentials and ask many questions before entrusting your child to them. Some reactions of the child and the child's needs can be anxiety, security, guilt reassurance, fearfulness, adult protection, acknowledgement, patience, Simplify tasks for the child, hypervigilant structure, consistency, facts, information, helplessness, physical nurturing, simplification of expectations from the child, out of control emotions can be helped by calm, peaceful environments. Reenactment, somebody to listen. Sometimes that's all they need is somebody who will listen even as adult victims of violence, this is the case. Fatigue, sleep, can be calmed by predictability or calmness. Teachers and counselor, counselors may need to be aware of inability to concentrate. A lot of the time these children are diagnosed with ADD when it is in fact a trauma-related incident that caused the lack of concentration in the first place. There's a lot of misdiagnosis to children that have been in abuseful situations or have been traumatized in some fashion. Helping your child. 
things that'll help your child, and they seem simple to some of us, but they're, they're not always, they don't always stand out in the way that we would think because the trauma-related actions of a child can be very frustrating for parents. Routine helps. Consistency, attending to physical increase of environmental security, removal from danger, re-empowerment. Allow the child to express fears without belittling and normalize rea their reaction. A lot of what makes them frustrated is that they feel their reaction is misplaced or they're told they're being dramatic when in fact they're just responding as anybody would to the trauma. Normalize, educate, address perceptions of guilt and correct. Do not place additional guilt on the child. Time alone with child if possible. One-on-one -on -one time is incredibly important. Acknowledging and normalizing the fear terror, not minimizing fear that they feel, creating a safe place for the child, emotional and physical reassurance. Now I noticed with my children, they like to do different things. Um, boys tend to react and open up and talk more if they're engaged in an activity they like. My eldest son liked to do all kinds of stuff. I could pretty much pick out any number of things that Michael would like to do. Jonah, on the other hand, which is my middle son, liked the video game. So I would take time out to play X-Men <laughs> on the computer with him. And that's the time that he would open up. Acknowledge that in your presence, you will keep them safe, but begin relating to their fear of and for their and your safety. My children often had dreams that were plagued with nightmares about their father murdering me after the domestic violence instant, instance. Unfortunately, a lot of this that I wrote about, I learned from experience. I did work in the mental health field, but they didn't address this type of individual um, issues with children that have dealt with abuse as much as I would have liked them to. I don't want you to have to learn this through experience, so I'm trying to help as much as I can right now with my experience. <clears throat> Increased physical attention emotional nurturing and support. Help them with tasks and responsibilities. Establish a routine with your children. Normalize what they're feeling, not the behaviors of the abuser. Let children make choices whenever possible and acknowledge that having choice is power. Um, sometimes something as little as allowing them to pick, you know, to choose the meal for the night can be very empowering to children. <clears throat> Remain calm, patient, address the child's worries, provide reassurance that things will change in time, that they will not feel like that forever. Allow for cat naps, keep home as safe and as calm as possible a refuge from demands, maintain routine and exercise with children, establish rituals before bedtime, avoiding stimulation activities such as TV. I personally read to my children a half an hour before they went to sleep and that seemed to really calm them down. Computers and other um, stimulation can actually cause them to not sleep as well. They should avoid that an hour before bedtime. They always had bath time for half an hour and then um, we would read for a half an hour prior to bedtime. Again, with my children routine was 7 p.m. bath time, 7.30 reading for half an hour and 8 p.m. prayers after which they went right to sleep. Except that in the trauma state, cognitive process may not work as they did previously with the child. Reactions to other trauma are beyond your children's immediate control. 
Make sure instructions are simple to the child. Remain patient as you will need to repeat yourself. Be prepared for that. Assist your child in the completion of activity, activities of daily living, homework, etc. Provide routine. Use notes and visuals to communicate as words alone may not be enough. Adult protection is not always possible and does not guarantee their freedom from additional trauma. Acknowledge the worry, but engage children in activities that take their minds away from the worry. Identify the elements of worry and change correct if possible. Trauma destroys a child's sense of safety and security. He will need time to feel safe again and to feel you can protect them. As a parent of traumatized children, it will be difficult to see your child revert to behaviors he engaged in years earlier. To see him act entirely different than the child you knew before the trauma. The child needs to be patient, and they need you to be patient. Whenever behaviors after their trauma, whatever they are, whenever they are, no matter how strange or frightening, They are for you. It's your child's way of dealing with the issue and feeling empowered and safe again. Be careful not to push him or change or stop until you have contacted a specialist. The best solution that I can give to anyone in helping a child with these type of trauma related is, is prayer, prayer, prayer. There is a reason why he, speaking of God, is called the great healer. For anyone interested in helping a child spiritually to heal from trauma, I would recommend the book, The Power of a Praying Parent. I have personally never encountered such a powerful book for praying for your children of any age in all of my life. Survival mode is something difficult to get out of and it doesn't happen overnight. Be patient, understanding, and loving. <clears throat> you are the best tool for educating your child as to what is right and what is wrong. On the left, you'll see a picture of my son. He knew all too intimately what trauma was like. Unfortunately, as a parent, I have been forced to deal with his suicide. What I find really ironic is that I wrote this note, January 16 of 2010. My son died in April 27th of 2010. I've had to go back and reread my own notes to reteach myself how to get through it and how to help my children get through it. And by the grace of God, to try to reach out to other parents so they can help their children when they need it. I hope this has helped you and will help you in dealing with your children and in understanding what they're going through as a result of trauma. My children witnessed my ex-husband break my back. They were very young. A lot of times the trauma behaviors 
don't come until years later or whenever that particular child feels safe. For my children, it was all at once. The three children that were, that had witnessed it about five years later when they felt comfortable and safe, they all started having nightmares of the incident. Through using these tools, I helped them get through it as much as I could. And I hope they help you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for your presentation on domestic violence awareness. We're going to shift gears now and go back to some of the footage from our 2014 Lansing Rally. Let's help put this on so everybody can tell their story. Um, my story is just as equally twisted, but before I go to it, I think it's funny because I just recently put a post on Facebook that said the reason that the Ten Commandments can't be put up into government buildings and courthouses is thou shall not lie, thou shall not steal, and thou shall not uh, cheat would cause a hostile work environment. Yep. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Like, I'm both parentally alienated from my two oldest, and CPS took my youngest. So I fall on both sides of the family court issues. And it's just as a, as an atrocity, uh, like, it's chaos. It's an alternate reality. Like, I haven't seen my youngest since February 14th of 2012, which was my goodbye visit. Um, I got an hour with my daughter and nobody had told her or explained to her what had been going on. It was my responsibility to inform her that there were no more visits, that I wasn't mommy. And I found out five minutes before the visit was supposed to be over that my daughter had no clue. Um, I promised her on that day that I would never stop fighting, that no matter what the court said, no matter what the appellate court said, that I was always going to fight for her. In my mind, I can't achieve full happiness without my children. I feel right. guilty if I have even a little bit of happiness because how can I even enjoy myself? How can I be happy? How can I smile? without them there, without knowing what's going on with them, without being able to see them, without being able to hug them. You essentially took away my life That's right. without killing me because I'm walking killing around without my heart. I walk around without my soul. That's right. um, my kids were my motivation. They were my drive. I might not have made the right decisions or the best decisions, but I try everything I did was for them. It was because of them. Um, my biggest gripe with the family court is that they are so uncaring and there's no compassion and there's no understanding and there's no explanation. When we say restart structuring the family court, the family court doesn't go off a burden of proof. Anybody that's dealt with the family court knows that somebody can say something to a caseworker. They don't even have to go into the courthouse. They don't even have to go into the courtroom. You don't get to face your accuser. You don't even get to know who your accuser is. There is no investigation into what the accuser's motivation can be. There's only an investigation into you. And even if they find out their investigation might have basis or you might not be the perpetrator and somebody else might be, there's no further investigation into that person. It still the focus is on that parent. That parent has to go. A child is always going to have a bond with its parents, regardless of how unhealthy the situation may be. It doesn't matter if there's addiction, if there's abuse. It doesn't matter. There's always going to be a bond. Every state, every agency gets money for the care of these children under the best interest of these children. It funds outside families 
puts our kids with outside families, with the outsider, with people they don't know, in situations that they can't be protected, in situations that the state has proven not to protect the children. If that funding was put back into these families that might have lifestyle concerns, might not be healthy, there might be some things going on that can be fixed. At the end of the day, the state gets enough money to put these parents through rehab, to put these parents through counseling, get these kids into the proper doctors, get people off food stamps and help with jobs. And that money could do unmentionable things and make the weakest family unit one of the strongest yes. family units. Right. And there is no focus on family. Family is not a focus, yet that's what's in the best interest of the child even in the worst case scenarios. It's up to us and we're the only ones that can make a difference. We need to raise awareness and we need people to find out what the system is like before it becomes their problem. Most people don't know what this is until they're the target or they know somebody that's a target. I walked into a family courtroom and thought, you have to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. I got this in the bag. No. They didn't have to have any proof. They didn't have to have any doctor's report. They didn't have to have any police report. They didn't even pull the detective in. In fact, I had a prosecutor in family court that tried to say there were charges going to be pressed and all kinds of stuff, and a detective that said, oh, no, we don't think anything happened. But they can do this in a family court. That's, right. That's criminal. You can go into a family court and lie on me, That's right. but I can't go into family court and talk the truth. Right. That's true. This has got to stop. Things have got to change. We need to pay attention for the things that are on the ballot, like Maria pointed out. We need to raise awareness. The people that don't know what's going on are the ones we want to reach. We already know what it's about. We already know what it's like. We don't need the education. We need to reach the people that don't know, because those are where the numbers are at. And we need to gather everybody and start making a difference. So. Did anybody else have a story they want to say? If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. I want to thank each and every one of you for watching this week's edition of Silent Voices. You can tune in next week. The same time, same channel. Until next week, friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make the, the difference. difference.